Good morning. Today we're going to begin a new series on how God wants to be worshipped. Now this topic may seem a little bit um, strange to take up an entire sermon series on how God desires to be worshipped. A lot of people just take worship for granted. You know, they feel like they do it in their car when they sing, you know, contemporary Christian music or maybe when they're at home praying. Um, there's different ways that we worship God, but it is a very important topic. Our scripture that we're going to be reading today is Hebrews 8. You want to turn to Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. May God bless the reading of his word. So we're going to be taking the next few weeks to examine this fundamental doctrine of the Christian life. How God wants to be worshipped. A lot of people will compartmentalize worship or will compartmentalize their entire Christian life. They'll make it something that they do on Sundays or something that they, it's like a switch that they flip on or flip off in their day-to-day -day life. Maybe they sit down to worship God for a minute. That's their time of Bible study, and then they go about living a normal life like everybody else, and they kind of leave their Christian life behind them. Christianity is very compartmentalized in a lot of people's lives. However, I would like to put forward to you that the doctrine of worship is crucial and fundamental in the life of the Christian. Understanding how God wants to be worshipped and understanding what part worship and living the Christian life plays in a day-to-day -day basis is crucial to being a Christian. <clears throat> we may ask practically, why are we here today? Why do we gather in a building on Sundays, sing hymns, psalms, hear a sermon, whatever the case may be? Practically, who determines what happens in this building right now? Why did we do what we did this morning? Why did we say the Apostles' Creed? Why did we sing the hymns that we sung? Was it something that Tom determined? Does Tom decide what happens up here today? Do I decide what happens? Do all of you get to vote and determine what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in this church? You know, church hopping is a very common practice today because people don't like what a particular church does, so they go to a different church. Some churches are focused on children's ministries. Some churches focus on outreach. Some have contemporary music, rock bands, drummers. Some have no music at all and sing psalms by uh, just voice alone. Some churches in Richmond here are specifically known for their massive size and having slides that go from the lobby into the worship service so your children can slide into the meeting. Some use fog machines, lights, make an amazing emotional experience for everybody involved. All of these things can make you feel very close to God. Without a doubt, there can be a lot of emotion stirred up. If you play the right music, if you dim the lights the right way. But who determines how and why we do the things that we do? Is it just a matter of preference? Do you, do you have complete freedom to leave here if you don't like the style that we have? and go to a different church that has a style that you like? Or does God have a say in what we do? Well, I would like to pose that God is the only one who has a say 
and what we do at church and the way that we do it and why we do it. <clears throat> when we examine all these different means and expressions and requirements of worship, how do we know what is correct? There are only two sources of truth. When you come to look at what we decide here and what happens here, there's only two sources that we can look to. Either we look to God and the Word, the Word of God, and it, we let the Word of God tell us what we're to do here today, or we let man decide, whether it be the elders, the deacons, or a, a collective group effort. It's either man or God who determines how we worship. We, we can either look to ourselves, to our standards, our traditions. Traditions are huge in the Roman Catholic Church or in the Eastern Church. There's all sorts of prayers, blessings, benedictions. Or do we look at exclusively what God says? If you recall anything about what we studied over the past few months when I was preaching on Zoom, and we were looking at the condition of man's heart and how man is totally depraved and wicked and evil without God intervening in his life, I think you would be amiss to say that it should be man to determine what happens in worship. We truly believe what the word says about the condition of man's heart as Jeremiah 17 tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it? Do we want that heart to determine how we worship God? Do we trust our own heart? Even if something feels right, how do we know that the feeling is right? Our heart is deceitful. It means it lies to us. The only way that we can know truly what is right is by the word of God expressly set down. What does God say? Thus says the Lord. Don't, don't you dare allow your heart to be the guide for your life. Because as soon as you do that, whether it be in worship or in anything else, the, the advice to follow your heart is bad advice. Because God tells us that our heart is full of wickedness and sin and envy, and all sin comes from the heart. Jesus actually said in Mark 7, he said, Are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without enters into the man cannot defile him? It's not the things that are out here that defile us. Because it entereth not into his heart. That which cometh out of the man, that defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, Proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile the man. So we cannot allow our hearts, our minds, our worldly wisdom to determine how we worship God. We can see from the events going on in the world today that Men are lost without Christ. The scriptures tell us that it's those things that are inside our hearts that are the root of evil. When, when the scriptures tell us how sin begins, it, it all begins in the heart. It might be something that we see that starts it off, but it immediately, the sin begins in our heart. You know, Another example of this is a lot of people uh, misapply the scripture where it talks about money. and It says that, you know, money is the root of all evil. Well, that's not what the scripture actually says. It says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Right? What's the difference there? Well, money is an external thing that we all work really hard for so that we can eat and live. Whereas the love of money references what? References the heart. And Christ specifically says you can't love both God and money which means that what Christ was attacking here is not money or external things. What he's attacking here is an idolatrous relationship with money. It's where you and your heart love something more than you love God. And you put that at a higher place than you place God in your life. 
Money is not an evil thing. It's not the outside things that defile. It's the heart. Point being that the heart is wicked, and from within, out of the heart of men proceeds evil. So it would be foolish for us to look at our hearts and say, this is the guide for worship in my life. Say, I mean, people, it just doesn't feel right to me. You know, I don't, I don't know. It just doesn't feel right. You know, how many times do you say that to yourself? I don't know. I just didn't really, I didn't care for it. Or why? I don't know. It just didn't feel right. Is that how we're to worship God? Based on our feelings, our emotions, our heart that's desperately wicked, deceiving us at every turn? The scripture from our reading this morning in Hebrews, it says that Moses was admonished of God. This is verse 5 in the passage we were reading this morning. Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, that he make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. Moses was admonished when he was building the tabernacle and setting up the traditions of worship in Israel that he follow the pattern exactly as it was shown him on the mount. What does this mean? This means that God took Moses to the mount and showed him every little detail about how God wanted to be worshipped. God said, here's exactly what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to build the building. Here's what it's to look like. Here's what you're to dress like. And here's how you worship me. Do it exactly like this. And he admonished Moses to do it exactly as the pattern was shown him. Not to deviate from it, not to add to it, not how Moses felt like God wanted to be worshipped. I mean, Moses knew God pretty well, probably better than we do. I mean, he was taken away and given the law of God. That's a relationship a lot of us probably don't have with the Lord. But it wasn't left to Moses to decide what the people were going to do for worship. It was left to God to admonish Moses to follow what he had been told by God, the pattern shown him on the mount. Moses was not free to do as he pleased. On the contrary, he was shown a pattern and told to follow it. And in verse 6, we're told, Now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. This is talking about Christ. So there's a direct correlation between the Old Testament tabernacle and the old way that we worship God and the new, more excellent ministry. But why would things change in how God wants to be worshipped? Meaning, why would we think that God expressly was going to set down how to be worshipped in the Old Testament and then just leave it up to our imagination in the New Testament? In chapter 21 of the Westminster Confession, it states, The light of nature shows that there is a God who hath lordship and sovereignty over all, is good, doth good unto all, and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted, and served with all the heart, with all the soul, and with all the might. But the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshipped according to the imaginations and the devices of men or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation or in any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. See, the Reformers understood this principle, and they wrote this specifically in opposition to the Roman Catholic Church, who at the time was full of traditions, full of the doctrines of men, praying to statues and carrying beads and crossing themselves and doing all sorts of things that we do not see expressly laid down in the Word of God. And they came up in opposition to this. The reformers saying, this is not what we see in the scriptures. God expressly says that it must be his word alone that defines how we worship him. This doctrine of only doing what God says is called the regulative principle of worship. It means that God regulates worship. Meaning simply that God tells us how to worship him, which is what the scripture says. Man cannot add to or take away from how God is to be worshipped, which takes the pressure off of us. A lot of people feel pressure. I don't know if I'm pleasing God. Are you doing what he says? So worship is very plainly laid out in the scriptures. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to delve into exactly what God requires of his church. Today, we're looking more at the foundations. 
Next week, we'll begin looking at exactly what God does want of his church. But it takes the pressure off because you don't have to wonder, is this, is this pleasing to God? Am I pleasing God with how I'm doing this with my children? Is, is our church pleasing the Lord? Was your church being obedient to God in worship? God, de God desires that we worship him in spirit and in truth. His truth, not our truth. <clears throat> the Presbyterian Reformed Church is like Tab Street here. We're built upon this doctrine, this principle. That's why it's so fundamental, so crucial to the Christian life. Some of the things we mentioned earlier in the list of what churches do, praying to saints, statues, gold, silver, crucifixes, etc. Celibacy for the priests. All these things were not ordered by God. The reformers took a hard look at the word of God and they simply asked the question, how does God want to be worshipped? What does the Lord say? In 2 Timothy 3, we read, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If we truly believe this scripture, then we must believe two things so far in this study. One, that our hearts are incapable of being the standard for which we worship the Lord. That should be basic knowledge for us at this point. Secondly, that the scripture is sufficient, thoroughly sufficient, to equip us and furnish us with the knowledge of how God wants to be worshipped. If the scriptures truly are able to furnish us and equip us, as 2 Timothy says, then we must believe that the scripture is completely sufficient to tell us how God wants to be worshipped. To further emphasize this doctrine in the scriptures and to show its validity and that God does not want to add to or take away from worship, I want to look at a couple of examples where God dealt with people who added or took away from worship. In Leviticus 9.22, it says that Aaron lifted up his hand towards the people and blessed them and came down from offering of the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came fire out from before the Lord, consumed upon the altar, the burnt offering and the fat, which then all the people saw. They shouted and they fell on their faces. Now, this was a time when the, the priest had just been, these, these new priests had just been established. And they came and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord. And the glory of the Lord appeared and fire descended from the Lord and licked up the burnt offering in front of them. And it says the people were so awe-inspired that they fell on their face to worship the Lord. I imagine we would probably react the same way in such a situation. And it was in this moment of just glory, the Lord's pleased with their worship. They did things right. They did it as God had commanded them. The two priests, brand new priests, who had just experienced this success, very excited about what they had witnessed. In Leviticus 10, the next chapter, it says that Nadab, Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein, put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Not that he commanded them not to, that he did not command them to do that. There was no express forbidding of them to do this. He just didn't tell them to do it. And fire came from the Lord again and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. In this story, we see that though their success as priests had just been witnessed, that God was pleased with them, that they thought, what can we do to please the Lord? And I believe their intent was pure. It says that they went to the Lord to offer again to him. They were so pleased with what they had done that they offered to the Lord again, except they did it in a way God had not told them to do it. And the Lord destroyed them for it. <clears throat> 
Again, commanded them not. This language is different than saying that the Lord had forbidden them from doing it. They were just doing something extra. John Knox said about this particular passage, he said that in doing this, this uh, strange fire that Nadab offered to the Lord, in the doing of this act and sacrifice, they were consumed with fire, whereof it is plain that neither the preeminence of the person that makes or sets up any religion without the express commandment of God, nor yet the intent whereof he does the same is accepted before God, for nothing in his religion will God admit without his own word, but all that is added thereto does he abhor and punishes the inventors and doers thereof. These men were priests ordained by God to worship the Lord. It means that if your pastor stands up and says, we're going to do something very similar to what we've done before. It's just a little bit different to please the Lord. He doesn't have the authority to do that. A king cannot do that. A priest cannot do that. No one has the authority to add to what God has laid down in his word as to how he wants to be worshipped. Whether it be in this world or the world to come, God will hold accountable those who add to or take away from his word. And there may be some temporary, temporary success or what we may judge as success in this world when we disobey God. You can steal and have a lot of money. It doesn't mean that God's not going to judge you for it. The same way you can disregard the way that God says to be worshipped. And God may choose not to judge you at the moment. And you may draw people to you with maybe the lights or the fog machines or the traditions or whatever it is that you add that people fancy, but God will judge those who add to the word of God. Deuteronomy 4.2, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. In Matthew 15, we see Jesus also condemn those who add to the word of God. It's not just an Old Testament thing. It's an entire Bible thing. Matthew 15, Jesus uh, Jesus was approached by the Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, and they asked Jesus, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now these Pharisees, these were the elders. These were the, the leaders, and oftentimes regarded as religious, eminent religious leaders of the day. And they said, Why are you allowing your disciples to violate our traditions? And he answered and said to them, why do you transgress the commandment of God with your traditions? For God commanded, saying, honor thy father and mother. But you say, whoever shall say to his father or his mother, it's a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not thy father and mother. And he held them accountable for one of their traditions that clearly violated one of the Ten Commandments. He said, you hypocrites... Isaiah prophesied of you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, but in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Why was it that they were not near to God? They did not draw near to God because their mouths worshiped the Lord, they honored him with their lips but their heart was far from him because they worshiped him with the doctrines and commandments of men. They worshiped God, but by the traditions and commandments of men. And so God said, your heart is not near me. You're a hypocrite and you dishonor the commandments of God. God's not pleased when we worship him, when we make up the rules. God does not desire lip service. He does not desire us to build works and traditions. He does not desire us to create means of worship. Our works are as filthy rags to the Lord. Again, this reminds us and circles us back around to total depravity yet again in our hearts. What arrogance and pride we must have as creatures to say, sure, you said this, Lord, but we can do it a little bit better. You'll like this. Trust me, it'll be fine. What arrogance we must have 
to dishonor the perfect commands laid down for us in the Word of God, clearly, precisely laid down, simple commands. Like I said, we'll get into these over the coming weeks. But what arrogance to set those aside and say, let's do it this way instead. If we twist the worship of our God into our own image, adding traditions or events or items or liturgies or anything to worship that God has not commanded, we are in grave sin. It does not matter our motives. It does not matter if we are being friendly or kind or loving or what we think are all of those things because our heart is deceitful and God determines what those things are. The Pharisees were honoring God, quote unquote, with cleanliness and traditions, with the washing of hands. Nadab who had just had a powerful moment where God had accepted the sacrifice of the people with consuming fire, wanted to offer another sacrifice to God with fire, but with strange fire that God had not particularly asked him to do. And he believed it would please the Lord, but the Lord consumed him with fire. Jesus at one point called the Jews children of the devil. In John 8, 42, he said, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. They were children of the devil because they could not bear to hear his word. They desired to follow their own desires instead. What made them children of the devil? Again, you got to remember, these, these were mouth-serving, honoring to God people. They followed all the traditions. They did all the right things. They came to church every Sunday. But God called them children of the devil. And it was because they could not bear to actually hear what God was saying to them. They didn't want to hear that. They wanted to hear the traditions of men. They wanted to follow their own intuitions. Even if it runs parallel with what God says, and it's almost what God says, it's not what God says. When it comes to worship, we don't get to make the rules. God gives us a lot of freedom when we're out there in the world doing our own thing. We have to make a lot of decisions. We have to make sure it doesn't violate anything God says. But when it comes to worship, God expressly sets down rules, and we don't get to add to that. 1 John 2 tells us in verse 3 that we know that we know God if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoso keeps his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. And hereby we know that we are in him. He that say, says he abides in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. This is important. Verse 7, he says, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. He says, this, I'm not writing something new to you. He's writing to the church. He said, I'm not telling you something new. This is the old commandment. I'm telling you to walk in what you've known. Walk in the truth laid down in the word of God. Your father understood. His father understood. It's right here. We've had it this whole time. It's not a new commandment. It's an old commandment. And if you walk in it, you know that you love God. If you say that you love God and don't obey what God says, you're a liar. The truth is not in you. Not only is it pride and arrogance that we think we can do better worship for God, or that we can expect to have more success because we come up with some sort of better worship service than what God has commanded. Not only is it arrogance, but it's also idolatry. It's idolatry because when we worship in a way God is not required, we're no longer worshiping the true God because he can only be worshiped in spirit and in truth. And when we invent modes of worship, it's no longer in spirit and in truth. It's our truth, not his truth. So it's a form of idolatry because we cannot worship God except the way that he prescribes. <clears throat> is most certainly not the God of the Bible or when we make up our own rules and our own regulations. Our God is a jealous God, a God that demands obedience to his word and worship. He does not find pleasure in our inventions. 
and additions, but he does desire us to worship him in truth. Our scripture from Hebrews that we've been reading over today, it tells us that every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, whereof <clears throat> it is of necessity that this man has somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God, and he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So in conclusion, what is it that we can take away from this and apply to our lives? And next week, we're going to actually dig into specific examples of what God wants us to do. Today, we've been looking at the foundations, what it means to worship God. Can we add to or take away from it? So takeaways from today, first and foremost, we cannot trust our hearts to worship the Lord. Again, this should be basic. I keep repeating it because it is fundamental and it is missed. But we cannot trust our intellect and our hearts to invent modes of worship. We can't. Because our hearts, no matter whether or not we are regenerated, as Paul described that inner conflict between the old man and the new man, that which he doesn't want to do, he does, and so on and so forth, right? That conflict that we have every day when we wake up, and we have to fight those sins that so easily ensnare us. That same heart is the heart that would invent those modes of worship. Even if something feels right or feels wrong, what does God say? Because often God asks the unpleasant things of us. Right? When Christ says, pick up your cross daily and follow me, it's not a pleasant experience necessarily. There's often a lot of persecution. There's a lot of conflict. Christ talked about dividing families, fathers and mothers and children and sisters and brothers. Right? The truth can cause a lot of division. When we do the right thing, there's oftentimes consequences. It's not always butterflies and flowers and love and joy. Sometimes it's turmoil. Sometimes it's prison, as we can see from the apostles. When we do the right thing, Sometimes it can be the difficult thing, but we cannot trust our hearts. We must follow after the truth of the word of God, even if it's the difficult thing. <clears throat> and secondly, we must keep in mind that God has expressly laid down how he is to be worshipped. The difficult thing or the right thing or whatever it might be, whether it's fun or not, the truth of worship is in this book, the word of God. And it is perfect and it is able to thoroughly equip us to every good work. We just have to have faith and trust and do the right thing. Next week, again, we'll delve into more details of how God wants to be worshipped and what the church is expected to do. Right now, I believe we have to... Uh, let's